Morning, everybody. Let me wind out so we can get some name tags here. But uh, this is the Hacking Company team, and we are talking about Market Insight. It is the beginning of February right now, Valentine's Month. Anybody else feeling the love? <laughs> Let's kick this off and get it started um, with uh, introductions. And oh, this morning, why don't you tell us about why you, uh, what you love about where you live? Uh, general areas or sides of the city kind of things. Uh, let's kick it off with Cordell this morning. How you doing, Cordell? Not too bad. Um, so my name is Cordell, and I live on the north side. I've always lived on the north side, and I like it because it feels homey. I know a lot of people. I go to the same stores ever since I was a kid, so it feels really good. I just all around, great neighborhoods. It's not as bad as everybody thinks. <laughs> awesome, man. Who do you want to pass to? Uh, I will give it to Craig. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Craig, and I live in the southwest end. Uh, Chappelle is the neighborhood I'm a part of. And I'm going to sound crazy here. My favorite part about living in Chappelle is the fact that it's still being developed. It's about 75% done, so I get to see new houses being built, and I'm pretty nosy. I like to walk around the construction sites, I'll be honest here. Uh, and I'll pass off to Amy. All right. I am also a Southwester. I live in Keswick on the river and the opposite of Craig. I love that this place is just about done, like 99.9%. .9%. I've lived here for about eight years. So my favorite thing about the community has to be my neighbors, but I love that it has parks and ponds mm -hmm. and walking trails and schools and everything is there. And I will pass to Tony. Hey everyone, Anthony D'Souza here. I'm a realtor on the team for the last four years and I live out in St. Albert. Um, I've lived in a couple different places since I've been in Alberta, but St. Albert definitely feels like home. I love how established the neighborhoods are. You know, when I'm driving home, it doesn't matter the season, I've got these nice canopy trees, you know, dog parks and outdoor rinks and it just, it feels great. So um, let's pass it over to Taylor. Morning, everybody. My name is Taylor, and I live out in Sherwood Park. And I got to say, the bubble wins. Everybody loves the bubble. You try to stay in the bubble. You don't want to go anywhere outside of there. We got all the good stuff. We got Millennium Place for the kids to go play. Uh, I just... I like it. Um, I like that idea of being slightly separate. Separate. Maybe it's because I came from a small town. Uh, but that's the, that's the thing I really enjoy about our bedroom communities. Um, let's get into some of these stats. Like, I think that everybody asks the same question when they come upon realtors, like barbecue or anything else. They're always going to fire out, hey, is it a buyer's market or a seller's market? What do you think? So usually that's gauged on months of inventory, Taylor. So three and a half to four months is considered a balanced market. And right now we're sitting just over 5.2 months of inventory. So we are in a buyer's market this time of year. All right. And how does that kind of compare? Like, do you guys remember the years of the past of what it's normally like as we run through January? Last year, January was hot. <laughs> it was, right? Like we were actually running into what would be the hottest spring market that I've seen in my real estate career, right? And I'm old. I've been here like a decade now. Uh, so when it comes to this, uh, taking a look at how the market's kind of moving, when I look back into like 2019 or 18 pre pandemic, this actually is well within the trend. Uh, the year normally starts with people kind of like figuring it out. Retail's normally huge in December. A lot of that distracts from real estate. Uh, when listings don't sell, Sometimes they relist, but if they end up with renewal dates into November and December, they often are like, we'll see you next spring, right, uh, to real estate in general. So I think that that very much affects the statistics, but I think that probably the biggest story right now is the statistics. What the hell did they do with them? Everything's all right? screwed up. <laughs> it does feel kind of screwed up. Well, it kind of feels screwed up, but we get some perspective here. So uh, we, Craig, you had worked in other markets in Canada and you saw the shift in statistics. And what they've done is they've kind of changed the way that we classify. And you were saying that you guys didn't like, we, this isn't messed up. This is like fixed. 
Yeah, the terminology from province to province definitely changes. It seems like they're trying to sync things up a little bit. So just for an example, we all know what a duplex is. Uh, that is considered a semi-detached home in Ontario. And I believe that's now what we're going to be classifying it here in Alberta as well. Now, Amy, you called the Realtors Association of Alberta yesterday, and we really appreciate that. Uh, not everybody knows that Amy has an education degree. So if we need to learn something, uh, we, we know a teammate to kind of send in that way. Now, Amy, you were saying that they're kind of looking at this like property first. Yeah, well, the reason that I wanted to call is that I actually own a property like this. I have a row house that's a rental property for me, and it's a condo. So I didn't know how to relook at the new, uh, the new categories, because the only thing that's listed as a condo now is an apartment style condo. So I thought, oh, wait, this doesn't make any sense. I couldn't find rural. So I just wanted to phone and find out. And after talking to the real estate board or real estate association of Edmonton, I felt a little bit more on their side. So basically they've broken it into property types, single family, um, semi-detached, which would be a duplex, like Craig was saying, row houses or townhomes, um, and then your apartment style condo. So even a residential, a, a single family could be a great big acreage. Um, you could have a row house and it also be a condo, but it's just qual qualified as a row house. But what I find handy is that as realtors, we still have the tools to differentiate and guide you. So they are using this for statistics, but we still have the, the right tools. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. Uh, we're going to use the high rollers. So these are the highest sales last month. And let's talk about the different types of property. So uh, apartment condominiums. So yeah. this was something that used to be a different class just called condo that would also include townhouses, right? Townhouses, duplexes. You can have a single family condo even. So it included everything with a condo fee. And that's because the board was looking at this as though it was ownership type first and then property type second. And now they've kind of changed it. So then when we talk about row and townhouse, we're including duplex in that. And there's a bunch of different types. The most common is a half duplex. And then you get these side by side and front to back and all kinds of stuff like that. But man, over the last few years, there's been this residential attached stuff coming in where it doesn't have condos. It's like four in or, or three or four units in a row that are technically kind of more like owning a duplex than they are like owning a townhouse, even though the property itself is similar. And then we get up into this semi-detached. So we're going to say that duplex is semi-detached. Is that it? That's the way that I understand it, is that row house would be more than two. Semi-detached would be two together. Okay, so this row house stuff that I'm talking about, this residential attached, is now fitting in here. And even though the experience that you have is going to be like a duplex without condo fees, mm -hmm. it's lumped in with a group that does have condo fees. Yeah. And that I think is going to be like, I think that that does have a statistical impact and, you know, I'm not the boss of statistics, but hear me out. Um, when somebody goes to get a pre-approval, they are pre-approved based on their monthly capacity. And uh, that means that let's say that they can afford $2,000 a month in real estate in that has to be their principal and interest or their mortgage payment. Also, their property tax and estimate of utilities and condo fees, if there are any. Now, right now, I think that mortgage money would say that it's about 60 bucks to get $10,000, $60 a month to pay service 10000 at current interest rates. And if that's the case, then if your condo fee is $300, it would lower your purchase, like your uh, buying power by like 50000 bucks. Well, here's the reason that I started off thinking it was bad, and now I don't think it's so bad. It depends mm -hmm. on what that condo fee includes, but in a lot of these row house products, similar to the one that I own, you're going to pay either way. Either you're going to put money into a savings account with your condo board, and they're going to take care of the exterior and the maintenance and all of that stuff, 
or you're going to. So it's not always a negative thing to have a condo fee. Yes, you have to read the bylaws and understand what you're getting into, but you're going to pay either way. Some of these homes include your utilities and all different kinds of things. Sorry, some of these condos. So read into it. It's not just about the mortgage money. And it does add up. Like even when you take about snow, lawn care and snow removal, if you were to put the same dollar value on your time as what you get paid at your job, like you're into the condo fees just from like doing the stuff around your house yourself. It's just uh, a life. Or in the range. And uh, Cordell, we were talking about this the other day. What is the average condo fee in the greater Edmonton area? Uh, the average condo fee is about $350 a month. Yeah. But there can be premiums. Like it can easily get to 600 if you're downtown, uh, different building types and stuff like that. But uh, that is what we we're talking about is like it, when you're lumping this stuff together in statistics, the townhouses and the row houses are going to be at very different sale prices because of someone's ability to purchase more when they don't have condo fees. And I think that that's going to make this kind of interesting to decode. But it just is what it is. So uh, getting back into this, then we would say, oh, as I, uh, well, there we go. I'll get this figured out. All right. I'm new at this slide thing. Um, <clears throat> so row and townhouse is those residential attached. So we just need to think more units than a duplex. As well as townhouses, which are uh, would include townhouses and carriage homes, properties that are not apartment style condos. Mm -hmm. And then we get into semi-detached, and the only thing in semi-detached is half duplex? That's the way that I understand it, yeah. And there was a half duplex last month that sold for 739000 Now, I've been in duplexes like this. Like uh, You find them sometimes in places like Oliver when they have high location value. But, man, some of the duplexes that you see in places like Windermere, also maze malls. I think we're seeing a lot of people downsize into this type of a product and they're downsizing from, you know, the detached that sold at 1.7 million. So they are an, um, sometimes an age in place product, which is why you're seeing them more high end. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of people now that instead of downsizing, they're right sizing. So they're actually staying very similar in price point, but they're just getting smaller, but really high end finishings. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and then detached. So when we're talking about detached, we're talking about single family detached dwelling, a house with no attached neighbors of any type. And that is pretty much the same as it was before. And so the difference now is just that this could be a rural property on, you know, five acres of land, or it could be the house next door. <laughs> So the big question is, is at 1.7, what do you guys think it was? Do you think that this was a rural property or do you think that this was a residential property? I think this was a residential property. Residential. residential. Waterfront so property is my guess. Water, waterfront. Uh, like riverfront? <laughs> riverfront, absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, well, that kind of clears it up a little bit. Um, so we're going to see that this will make it easier for us to compare city to city, right? Uh, because the whole initiative is to uh, change the way that we're looking at these um, at these different uh, statistics so that we can kind of view apples to apples. I'm going to bring in the big group of statistics. Question for everybody here. Okay. Do we think that they change this because we have such high net migration numbers that people coming from BC and Ontario were like, what is a duplex? What are you talking about? <laughs> do you think it's all to do with net migration here? I was just going to say that I think that's exactly what they're trying to do. Um, they're trying to make it even across the board so everybody knows what they're talking about. Like Taylor mentioned, apples to apples. So we still got some stuff to sort out with BC and their strata versus our condo fees, but overall, the property type should make more sense across the board. Yeah, if we're going to normalize it like that against the provinces, we also need to include uh, luxury tax in the statistics. Like how much did this actually cost you? Because I don't know if you know this, but luxury tax only applies to vehicles in Alberta. And you got to get into six-digit vehicles before you have to pay that tax. And there's some provinces that have moving taxes too, where we do not here. So. Moving taxes. They're starting to look like a car dealership. 
<laughs> people from moving from out of province too, uh, they don't realize that we don't have a land transfer tax. And that is a great surprise from somebody coming from Toronto. Okay, so what's it like in Toronto when somebody buys a property? What's a land transfer tax? How much money is that? Oh, it depends on your purchase price. But I do know that in most of Ontario, there's a land transfer tax. Uh, there's a calculator, but the Toronto area is double that from my understanding. So you get an extra premium <laughs> expense when you're in Toronto. When you're outside the city, it's not as much. But for example, uh, a $400,000 property, you might be looking around, you know, 3500 to 4000 in land transfer tax. Oh, wow. Outside of Toronto. That's miserable. <laughs> all right well <laughs> i'm glad that the uh, i'm glad that they're taking a step in this direction i'm interested to see where it goes now where did you guys see days on market go when it comes to uh last uh last month so we're looking at the numbers as they come out of the january realtors association statistics and we just helped everybody kind of clarify with these different um property types what do you guys see and how does this compare to what you're feeling in the marketplace? Okay, so this is only comparing last year to this year. So this is year over year, not month over month. But you can see that everything here is nominally similar. We are looking a little bit longer for detached and, or sorry, a little bit less time for detached and a little bit more time for semi-detached. That's I like how they're comparing this directly year over year because like January market is very specific, right? Uh, yeah. You probably have less competition as a good seller. Uh, but we're also seeing that those apartment style condos are just as cold as they were last year. And we we're really hopeful for those ones. I also yeah, wanted I got to a say comment that about the, the detached sales as well. So we're seeing <clears throat> the detached homes are taking a little bit longer than the semi detached. And I think the biggest reason why is the price point. A lot of the, the properties that seem to be moving pretty quickly are like an entry level home or like a first time buyer approaching a property. And they seem to be uh, in high demand right now with everybody conscious about interest rates. That's one thing, one of the trends I noticed from last year. I think now, what do your teammates think of that? <clears throat> I think January is a little bit tricky because we're dealing with a lot of old product on the MLS. And just yesterday I was saying, oh my gosh, look at all this good stuff that's coming out. It felt like for a while there wasn't any good stuff and it's there now. So I think next month we're going to see a drastic change. So who, any, do we have any dissenting opinions on that? No drastic change next, next month. What do you guys think? I'm noticing momentum pick up. There's a lot of people that put off their purchase last year just because the constant announces of interest rate hikes, fear of recession. We're now we're into a new year. Spring is coming a little bit earlier. People are motivated. So people who have been putting off those purchases are jumping into the market. So uh, I do think the momentum is going to continue. So you agree with Amy. Both of you guys are saying that you're feeling it right now with uh, people calling you for appointments. People seem to be like it's almost like the weather right now where it's a little bit um, seasonally high. And also this team came off an incredible January. So like, good job, everybody here, like starting your year uh, really well. Uh, that's also something that's super exciting. I think Tony, are you going to break a hundred five-star reviews on rank my agent this week? <clears throat> yeah, I'm hoping to break a hundred this month, but it might happen this week. Who knows? Oh, wow. Well, I imagine that there's a few people out there like uh, clay super dude. Uh, are someone that we see as a constant friend of the show on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> maybe he'll rally some folks, but I guess rank my agent is verified. So they all have to have MLS numbers and uh, properties they bought. That's the cool thing about that service. Um, now, anybody run into anything that surprised the hell out of them this month in real estate? Myself in particular, I've noticed, uh, I was out with two families this weekend and we both found properties that have only been on the market a couple of days and they went into multiple offers, both of them. So we were competing on both. Uh, so that is something that is a little bit surprising to an extent, but again, properties that are priced well in great condition, they garner a lot of attention. Well, that's interesting because like, look how many new listings that we have, right? Tony, take us through. Yeah. So when we look at what's happening month over month, 
like, uh, you know, 2297. We're up pretty substantially from where we were at this time last month in December. And um, compared to the year before in January, we're only up just a touch um, because January last year was super hot. And so it just seemed like things were flying off the market. But it's nice to see that we're actually getting some decent inventory last month uh, compared to years in the past. Yeah, well, look at the squeeze last month, right? Like there was so few listings last December. Do you think that that's tied to the people having fear because the market, like they kept announcing interest rate changes? I think it could be. I think it also might be a lot of um, a lot of people feeling like they it's time to make a change. They feel comfortable being out in public, and they're you know now's the time. Let's not wait any longer. So it's interesting to see a lot of people mm-hmm. seeing sold signs up in their neighborhoods saying we should do this too. Right? Why are we waiting? Or hey, maybe it'll take a little longer than we thought. I've heard a lot of about that too. So they're looking to get a head start on the spring market. And a lot of people are wondering about values. Did you guys see that the tax assessments are out? We do this part as part of market research on every property. And the thing that we do is we actually pull last year and this year. So seeing the change from last year, this year, I got a call from somebody that lives over in uh, Forest Heights, actually. And they're like, can you take a look at this? Because like, I love the idea that I'm building equity, but I, I think they're stealing tax money. I don't think I'm doing this well. And sure enough, they were quite a ways off. In fact, I think that they would have been like uh, maybe like 8% off. So interesting to see. Anybody else seeing uh, uh, talking to people about tax assessments? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have the idea like if, you know, we're tax assessed for a certain amount, like that's the number you would like list at if you were just trying to give your house away. I've heard that a lot recently. And, um, you know, when we can show them what properties actually sell for, like true market value is what the buyers are willing to pay. And so when you talk to them mm. through their tax assessment, we might be able to help them, you know, steer them in the right direction if they need to get the city to reassess them, if, they, if they've if they got, uh, you know, leg to stand on there, so we can provide some information there. But everybody's tax assessments have gone up, right? Everybody's going to be paying more taxes. It's kind of a trend that we're seeing, but we definitely have come across some of these assessments that are completely out to lunch. And a good reminder oh, totally. there is that these assessors don't stand in your home. And they don't come by and knock on the door and say, can we have a look? They just, you know, increase it based on mill rates that they have um, planned for. I'm noticing out in the market when I'm out with buyers, many sellers have their new tax assessment on their refrigerator trying to show people (laughs) the value of their home, even though their list price is under. Okay, so so let's, I need to address that uh, because I've seen it as well. What message do you think that they're trying to convey? Like if you step into the seller's shoes and say like, okay, so we all know you put it on there for us, but like, what do you think they were thinking? They're proving their value. They think they are anyway. They see it as like proof of value? Yeah. So they put it up on there and like the tax assessment might say like seven fifty, and you're standing in a place with a list price of six ninety nine nine. It's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's how it looks like, right? But if you talk to most sellers, they would say like you shouldn't sell your property if it's below your tax assessment. Have you ever heard that as like a rule of thumb? I can imagine why you would say that. <laughs> well, I think that that might come from like uh, trying to time up markets. So if your tax assessment was up from last year, that means that the market is heading up and that's a time to sell. If your tax assessment is lower than last year, or sorry, if your current market value is lower than your tax assessment, and they do have a timestamp, like they're July of last year, right? That's when the estimate is technically supposed to be valid from. And so if your if your property value is lower than that, well, then it's probably an indicator that it's a buyer's market. But some people think that the, that the market will always give them more than their tax assessment. Like it's like a screwed up view of that to be like, no, no, no. Use it as an indicator as to whether or not it's a seller's market or a buyer's market. If the market's moving up, it's very likely to be a seller's market. But uh, I, I find that that's hilarious. And no, it doesn't influence anybody. In fact, I've actually had a client in the past that went to the city and applied to have his tax assessment raised because he thought it was a factor in selling his house. And I'm like, it probably is. The next person is not going to be happy that you just raise the amount of taxes they're going to pay. 
<clears throat> now, I pulled up the uh, information on sales. Um, Cordell, can you just talk through what we see? Sure. Um, so last month, um, we had 986 sales, and that's up month over month from December. But if we're looking at last January, um, we're actually down substantially, 25%. But that's because last year was such a hot January that this year just isn't the same, especially with all the interest rate hikes. Anybody else feel the same? Mm -hmm. So like when we're talking to people that are approaching the market as sellers and we're looking at like the last 12 months off and of properties that are very similar to them, we have to pay a ton of attention to dates right now. You know, like if, uh, if the, the person who set the high watermark sold yesterday, that's awesome. That's a valid uh, support of value. However, if the person that set the high watermark for value sold in March of 2022, is that a value that you think that you can achieve like seven interest rate raises later? We're going to probably agree. get there, but I don't know that we're there yet. So that opens another question. Why isn't real estate dropping like a hot rock right now? I think that when you ask that question, a lot of people will say, look at other markets. And sometimes it comes across as like, well, it could be worse, which is not what it means. What it means is that if you look at those other markets, they had a trajectory that shot up, peaked and started coming back down. Whereas we didn't have that. We did see our, our prices go up a little bit and then they're, they're just exactly where they should be. So we're not seeing the same thing that other markets are seeing. I would totally agree with that. And actually, we moved on from where we were talking about deed transfer tax, but we got Christian Bailey, former Hacking Co. teammate and HGTV star, uh, coming to us from Halifax saying that they have 1.5% deed transfer tax. This sounds like a car dealership. It sounds like an admin fee or an internet fee. What the hell is that? Totally. Deed transfer tax. So when like uh, why isn't he, why isn't the real estate dropping here the same way it's dropping in those other markets? I think a big part too has to do with the fact that so many people from those markets are moving here and they all need homes. I think we had sixty five thousand people last year move to Alberta. How many of those people needed to buy homes? Probably quite a bit. Actually, it's that's great information, and we did set records. Like since they started recording. And I think you're right on the button with how many people moved here. And that means that, like, let's say that all of those people, like, it's going to be less properties than that because many people live together. But all of those people became sellers in those markets and didn't replace themselves as buyers or buy more. So they leave gaps in those other markets, right? And then when they come here, they fill demand and it's all supply and demand. So yes, there would be less demand if it was just interest rates that were the factor. But interest rates minus net migration is damn near even from what we can see statistically. Crazy, hey? Who thought we were going to be like the little bright spot in the storm? I did. I always knew it. You did? <laughs> <laughs> the eternal optimist? <laughs> So we've been talking about the news a lot lately. Cordell obviously has things like net migration on his mind because what do we talk about that weekly for like the last year? Yeah. And is there any other news stories that are kind of like uh, occupying or uh, living rent free in your head? Rent is nothing rent. right now. <laughs> I think a lot of people are rent is that's something that's definitely standing out. If you're an investor, rents are rising. So a lot of people are getting into the market because if interest rates are rising, mortgage payments are rising, rent is rising as well. And I know that was uh, in the news that we were discussing earlier in the week. Yeah, I see so that. Talking this... Go ahead, Tony. I was going to say a lot of people complaining about not enough good things to rent right now. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people that were running around with pre-approvals that didn't end up buying anything, that were kind of scared off by the rates going up. You know, a lot of them have been telling us, hey, you know what, we got to remember why we started. We wanted this plan to buy a home. And you know what, the rates aren't as bad as we thought. Let's jump in because there's not a lot of good stuff to rent. So I think it's interesting to see that trend. Well, if that trend continues, there's not going to be very much to buy. 
because when we take a look at how that affects inventory, Cordell, you were saying that people are moving here. Well, not all of them buy, some of them rent, but that means that those rental properties would have sold if they couldn't get tenants. That's normally what landlords will do if things are not performing. Well, now landlords are buying more because the return is better. It's actually easier to make money in markets where the interest rate isn't at a historic low. And so we're seeing about 5,200 uh, listings on the market right now. And I, I just got to ask you straight, and you guys can please be candid here. Hot or not? Is most of the inventory on the market hot or not right now? Not. The brand new stuff, not. hot. The rest, not. It's hot by comparison. The, the The market is like, it's like winners hasn't had a delivery in six months. You know, like you're walking through looking for a jacket. This one's missing an arm. What the heck's going on here? It's like when you have food in your fridge, but you really want to go to Popeye's. You know what I mean? It's like the stuff that's yeah. out there seems more appealing than stuff in your own home. So that's what I'm seeing with the inventory right now is a lot of stuff that might have been sitting for a while, especially if it was listed before Christmas. Uh, not a lot of price changes. It's kind of stale. But then the new stuff comes on and there's a rush, right? We're seeing multiple offers on those properties. And some of them have been really similar to the stuff that's been sitting, but people aren't finding them. People aren't as interested and they're not worried about losing those ones. Man, that stuff that's been on for months and months, it's literally like they got their pricing from the cinema. Like the, the it's theater popcorn pricing. And we've had some buyers that have been really attracted to property that's just overpriced and, and they're, I don't know what's going on, but like Cordell, uh, the property that uh, we were working on recently, it was so difficult to try, like you could tell that their agent was uh, exasperated. Uh, we were exasperated. We're like, listen, everybody in the world can, it, can see that what you have is it, nobody's going to buy this for this price. And we're afraid to buy it at that price because you can't get that price, you know? Yeah. But sometimes, uh, uh, you know, like people want money and they're thinking that it's the one, like there's just the right person out there. Like, what do you, what do you want people to know? Like uh, we've all had listings that are on the market for 60 days, no price changes. And what do you really want to tell those people that sometimes they, they may not be able to hear? I think if it's time to do a price change, it's time to do a price change. And we're going to help guide you there so that we can help get you off the market and get you the best price that we can get you. Yeah, we understand that's hard. We're trying to get the most money, but in the end, the most money is probably consistent with the price change. Do you know how many listings over 60 days on market with no price change actually get an offer? It's in the single digit percentages. It's part of playing the game. It's so hard to stay relevant when you're that long without a price date update. And if you don't know what price date is, talk to your agent. Price date rules the world online, right? We know that refreshing price date by changing price can be as effective as a uh, multiple off or as a uh, new listing. And have you guys seen this yet? Uh, is, is it new listings or is it price drops that are attracting those multiple offers? Sometimes it can be both depends on the, mm -hmm. the price drop and where they end up dropping into. But, I, you know, sellers are worried that that makes them look vulnerable or that they're not leaving themselves room if they get a low offer. And it's like buyers don't make low offers these days. For the most part, they're making informed offers or they're making an offer based on how they feel. And so if you're going to if you're willing to accept slightly less of a price than what you're listed for, why not tell everybody, you know, and that's like the best defense against low offers as a recent change. So I wish a lot of more, a lot more people knew that. Yeah. That's the one thing that I think that you guys are just crushing it at. Like when we sit down with families, we are in it to win it. And we show them the tactics and the strategies of how to play with the market and get above the noise. Uh, we got some exciting things coming. You guys got a fistful of listings, not on the market yet. Like I'm looking at the sheet and like, man, it's fun to sit on this much inventory and there's some hot stuff. Uh, I think that uh, both Amy and I have uh, listings coming to the market later this week. And uh, Amy, uh, you, this little place, this little tiny place that you're bringing <laughs> to the market. Right? No, this absolutely no. amazing walkout bungalow acreage is coming to the market two minutes from Sherwood Park. 
that's going to be exciting. And uh, we've also got a lot of action on other things. Who's got buyers here that are like just begging for the next listing to come up? Yep. I think, Cordell, you're out all over the world today. You're in Sturgeon County and Beaumont? Uh, yeah, and tomorrow as well. <laughs> all right. Well, let's put some miles on. I uh, really appreciate you guys uh, coming in to talk a little bit about what you see in the marketplace as well as what we see in the statistics. That really helps people get a rounded opinion. Uh, is there anybody who has like uh, information for, like, as we close... Let's talk about those people that are waiting for inventory. Okay. What do you want to say to the people that are waiting for stuff to get listed uh, right now as we close the store, close the show, you can pass off to each other and we'll start with Craig. So right now we have inventory starting to come to the market. The groundhogs day just happened. I don't believe he saw his shadow. Spring is coming early. We have great weather. So inventory is coming right now. Uh, get ready to view some homes and I'll pass off to, to Amy there. Yeah. I was going to say, be ready. When a good house hits the market, it goes right away. You, if you're sitting around waiting for listings and then you're going to get it together, you're going to lose. And I will pass to Tony. Yeah. I think a lot of people think the spring's the only time to list your property, but although there might be more demand, there's also going to be more competition. So get listed now, get a, get a head start. Pretty good. Cordell, and who'd you like to pass to, Tony? He said Cordell. It just got missed. Oh, uh, my apologies. Um, and I was I was going to go off uh, what uh, Anthony said. Um, not only listing in the spring, but I was talking to a couple who said they don't even want to list their house until they find what they're looking for. And I'm trying to guide them into why that's not a good idea because they'll end up missing out on what they want, because if they want it, there's likely that other people think it's a hot property too. The only time when you can do that is if they have enough to have both. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, but honestly, those people that do have enough to do both, uh, right now, like if you find something, the market's going to really welcome your sale as well. Uh, I think that we all agree that if you're thinking about selling first, get to the market. It's time. Right. Like if you're waiting for the spring, the tip of the spring is the best time for sellers and it's time. So uh, come on in and those buyers as well. Uh, we hear you. Um, but get out there and try on a few, you know, mm -hmm. try on a few houses, walk through the right house in the wrong neighborhood, because we're going to have to be so fast when that listing comes to the market. And this team exact has exactly what you need to do that. So thanks so much. Uh, and great to chat with you guys. I hope you have a remarkable day. See you guys. See you guys.